pamphlet that has been circulated to you. Now then, without further ado, we would like to start the opening session for the first Tokyo Global Dialogue. We would like to call upon the president of the JIIA, Kenichiro Sasai, to deliver a few welcome remarks and also launch the JIIA annual strategic report. So, Ambassador Sasai, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am currently serving as the president of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, JIIA, and I would like to welcome you all to the first uh, Tokyo Global Dialogue. This dialogue is held in commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. For two days, we are going to hear from about 60 speakers from 13 countries, including Japan and other countries in the world, uh, experts and intellects. And we are expected uh, to hear a very exciting intellect, uh, intellectual dialogue on international matters. And as has been explained, we are going to hear from Foreign Minister Motegi and also Prime Minister Abe during this meeting. So as the sponsor of this meeting, we really hope that through this two-day meeting, uh, we can have an exchange of diverse views of truly global nature that would be of some reference for all of you. Currently, the global society faces serious challenges, including the rising nationalism and uh, prevailing unilateralism in some countries in the world, and challenges on the values of liberal democracy or rule of law is getting greater. The rule-based international order that used to function, albeit with some imperfection, are now faltering. That is the reality in front of us. Against such backdrop, I have become the president of the Japan Institute of International Affairs and started uh, to ask myself, what is the role to be played by a Japanese think tank and what can think tanks do? And we have started new two attempts. First of all, considering uh, the transformation of the international order, there are many incidents and events that uh, we have not anticipated or expected up to now. And so uh, we have attempted to, uh, to offer a timely opportunity uh, to carry out multilateral discussions with the participation of practitioners and intellects. I have to admit, Japanese think tanks had not been very active in offering such fora. Therefore, we would like to play an active role in giving opportunities to various parties uh, to carry out a very fruitful dialogue. And the second attempt is that the outline of such dialogue and discussions and also results of research activities carried out by experts and researchers affiliated to JIIA needs to be made accessible and issue and distribute the results in Japan as well as in countries other than Japan uh, very extensively and effectively. So as part of our attempt, JIIA is now publishing the strategic annual report in addition to the existing series of publications and research papers. So this annual report describes our view on the global development and 
what are the outlooks going forward. It is really a very difficult global environment, but what are the points that are very clear to us that we need to bear in mind? And what would be the actions that the Japanese government should take? Today, we are distri distributing copies of this 2019 version of the strategic annual report. And in this report, uh, we are, of course, issuing uh, various warning signs. First of all, as the U.S.-China strategic competition surfaced, we have emphasized the need for Japan to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance as well as promoting strategic stability among Japan, the United States, and China. Secondly, battle on hegemony of advanced technology and the differences of the basic values of the national governance systems in the world have the potential uh, to generate a deep-rooted conflict in among the countries in the world. So in this context, international order in the free and open Indo-Pacific and new strategic uh, security strategy is something that needs to be addressed. Thirdly, the activities related to nuclear non-proliferation in North Korea and Iran and uh, the faltering nuclear arms control post-INF are matters of great c concern. Fourthly, in the Middle East, this new strategic map between the United States and Russia and the major Middle Eastern countries are still gives us much apprehension because this may not necessarily lead to the stability in the Middle East. And also, the situations lack predictability, which requires further consolidation and collaboration among the countries in the region. Fifthly, the European countries are in turmoil, and the assessment of the strategic positioning of Russia are also carried out in this report. And so we are referring to further collaboration of uh, the European countries and Japan as well. So I really hope that you would go through this strategic annual report at your leisure. But I'm pretty sure that the themes that are taken up in this annual report uh, overlaps with today's subject. Is it possible to build an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules? So I would be very grateful if this strategic annual report would be some reference material for today's dialogue. So is it really possible to build an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules? My answer is yes. Well. Maybe this is debatable. However, I believe that to make it possible, we need, and also the political leaders of the world and the citizens of the global community need to recall that this rule-based international order, which had functioned up to now, uh, had sacrificed many things for the past century and had become a reality as a result of the great effort made by our predecessors. So to rebuild this international order, we must truly unite. The other day, our great political leader, former Prime Minister Nakasone, had passed away. So. I would like to pay great tribute and express my great condolences to the passage of Prime Minister Nakasone. Considering uh, the global situation currently, when the Cold War was not yet over, Prime Minister Nakasone had 
work together with the aspiring countries of the world, together with his counterpart, former Prime Minister Nakasone, had made great effort to realize peace in the world. And uh, this opportunity had made me recall what a great man former Prime Minister Nakasone was. So is the current world directed towards this rule-based international order? It is very important for us to reflect on what we have done so far, but at the same time, for the coming 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, we need to anticipate what may happen going forward and have a clear future vision so that we know what we must do at the moment. Now, the Japan Institute of International Affairs was established under the initiative of former Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida 60 years ago in December 1959 as a nonpartisan comprehensive political think tank in the area of foreign diplomacy and security. Today, the meaning of the nation state, civil society, as well as think tanks are questioned. And we are very grateful that we can, under such circumstances, that we can make a mark a new chapter in the history of JIIA by holding the Tokyo Global Dialogue and publish the strategic annual report. I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who had ex extended great support to JIIA's activities and look forward to receiving your assistance and cooperation in the future as well. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much, President Sasae. The next session, which will be a keynote address by His Excellency Edna Biofami, Dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and Professor of Practice at the American University in Cairo, former Foreign Minister of the Arab Republic of Egypt, will deliver a keynote address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Chairman Oka, President Kinchero Sasi, members of the Japanese Institute of International Affairs, and its supporters, I very much appreciate your kind invitation extended to me to come and participate in this important meeting with this very distinguished group of uh, participants, both local and international. Before uh, engaging in my comments, let me add my words of condolences to my Japanese friends on the passing of the former Prime Minister Nakasone. I had the honor of meeting him uh, when I was posted here in the 90s and uh, very vividly remember his wisdom and statesmanship as he looked at the challenges of the international community. So please do accept my condolences. Ladies and gentlemen, the international order and consequently the regional one in the Middle East are all facing unprecedented disarray. Commensurate with that situation, I myself will reverse the order of my comments and start with my conclusions and then later my explanation. Personally, I unwaveringly believe that a rule-based world order is necessary and that it is what serves the Middle East most as well as all regions that are composed mostly of medium-sized states. I would even venture to postulate that it is the only order to sustainably serve the world community at large in this era of globalization. The real question thus is, is not whether a rule-based order is viable or not, but rather what kinds of rules, what kind of rule-based order, and for me, what is required of the Middle East region to benefit from it. Ladies and gentlemen, the modern international order was developed after the Second World War 
with the UN Charter as its legitimate referential framework for, for the conduct of international relations with the primary purpose of preventing a third world war. Today, 80 years later, the said international order stands challenged. And I am using all of my 40 years of diplomacy in choosing that word. The relative power of states has expanded or diminished. Others emerged as powerful players, including non-state actors. Moreover, the world is no longer bipolar nor unipolar, but in many respects, pluralistic. This changing paradigm and static political culture are what raise questions about the world's order ability to remain relevant as we move forward. A unique characteristic of our times is that with potential and opportunity, we also see an increased level of anxiety and concern. With many benefits of globalization, open door markets, and the facilitated mobility of persons, finance, and ideas, comes the spread of uh, epidemic diseases like bird flu, Ebola, the expansion of organized crime, and we witness propagation of extremist fanatic discourses and organizations across Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and even the Americas. Societal insecurity has led to a sweeping rise of nationalist right-wing political currents around the world. This alignment of popular and governmental anxieties has produ produced isolationist policies that reject one another and often prioritize nativist ethnic ties over nationalistic bonds and national adherences over regional and international kinship. Moreover, the current international order faces greater popular critique and uprising, exemplified in the resounding political unrest, unrest most recently witnessed in Chile, Hong Kong, Lebanon, and Iraq, and I'm only referring, referring to the most recent example. Multilateralism itself is being questioned by a rise of popularism, xenophobia, growing trends of isolationism in politics, as well as social divisions even throughout Europe and the United States, the most affluent of communities. And as a result, the shifts our, order, our world order is experience, experiencing include a gradual restructuring in the framework of global governance. The formal institutions functioning within the UN framework are giving way to more informal bodies and ad hoc fora around issue-specific agendas. This informalization of international governance has created a dense web of global networks that will increasingly set the international agenda. The question, however, will they respect a rule-based order or simply pursue the goals and interests of the few? Ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East, or Near East as it is described by some, living beyond, is situated in the center of the world at crossroads between continents oceans, and seas. For generations, it has been rich in natural resources and consumed by turmoil. It is changing as the world is changing, affected by and affecting the global paradigm. Generally, one can define the Middle East as including the Arab world, Iran, and Israel, as well as in more frequent permutations, Turkey. <coughs> and this region, has witnessed times so challenging that the very question of the viability of the nation, not only the question of the viability of the rule-based order is, is put to task, but actually the viability and the continued relevance of the nation-state system is being brought to task. The volatility of the transformation has differed among its countries, but the reasons for its acuteness and fractitious nature are mostly the following. Firstly, Arab leaders in the Middle East over almost half a century have had a generic resistance to the inevitable, which is incremental change, as time takes its toll, creating new realities. Rather than evolution, these countries generally witness extended static periods, leading to stagnation, 
than revolutions. When constituencies frustrated, when the constituency frustration surpassed the ability to cope with the difficult circumstances. Second, a large number of Arab states exercised inefficient governance, thus bringing into question and severely testing the social contract between the governed and the governing. The result was a loss of confidence reciprocated with each seeing the other as the core of the problem, a situation where self-destructive zero-sum games appeared to be the only option. Thirdly, over the same half century, all Arab states, without exception, have at one time or the other over-depended on foreign powers or security affairs. And this has had dangerous dual consequences. The result was an, a national an Arab national security deficiency vis-a-vis -vis their non-Arab neighbors, Israel, Turkey, and Iran, which also encouraged its neighbors to pursue overzealous hegemonic attitudes with complete disrespect of international law. The overdependence on foreigners also created a foreign, a foreign stakeholder involvement in internal affairs of these states. Fourthly, with the existence of a substantial Arab youth bulge of more than 65% of the population, a legitimate but unrealistic sense of urgency to resolve problems that were endemic prevailed. The three non-Arab Middle Eastern states have witnessed their own challenges and transformations as well. Primarily, they were challenges of identity. Turkey and Israel had to determine did they want to be Middle Easterners or extensions of the West. They also need to define the fine line between faith, faith-based identity and secularism. Some of the same questions even uh, relate to the situation in Iran, although the debate about secularism is not as prominent there. Whatever one may argue, there are examples of clear violations of international law, and I just simply mention a more recent one, the Turkish incursion in uh, Syrian territories. Iran, directly and indirectly, has pursued policies that at the very least have raised concerns in neighboring Iraq as well as uh, more recently in the Levant and have been a source of anxiety of its neighbors. Israel remains the occupying power in the longest standing conflict in the Middle East. Its, its intransigent positions have increased. Its propensity to repeatedly violate international law is incorrigible, including land annexation, settlement activity, discrimination against citizens of Arab origin, and cross-border use of force. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation in the Middle East is beyond doubt of severe concern, and the states of the region, without exception, share in the responsibility for where we are today, although to different degrees. The responsibility, however, for threats to the international order at a, at a global level based on free, fair, and transparent norms also, and if I may say even more so, falls on the shoulders of the international community, particularly the five permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. It is the body with the primary responsibility for preserving international peace and security. Ladies and gentlemen, the UN Charter codified norms and regulations adopted eight decades ago was a seminal document. It was both ambitious and rationally wise at the same time. From its very beginning, it uses the phrase, we the people, underscoring that the main stakeholder is humankind and that we had a common ownership. In its articles, it suggests collective security, measures which underscore that security cannot be achieved individually, nor is it a zero-sum game or one at the expense of another. At the same time, the Charter pr provisions acknowledge sovereignty of nations and non-interference in their internal affairs, in recognition of our diversity and right to pursue our own paths within the parameters of international law. As such, the Charter was meant to provide a foundation 
for an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules for collective action based on a balance of interest in accordance with these provisions and in application without preference or prejudice. Ladies and gentlemen, regrettably, we have all failed in this respect, particularly the major powers, because, and I'm going to be very blunt, they have tended to subjectively apply uh, these, these provisions or at least subjectively respond to violations uh, to international law depending on political expediency of the time, the person, and the theater. And I would add that the major powers have too often fell back into adversarial positions with a balance of power mentality rather one of collective interest, which is the basic foundation of the UN system. As the international community expanded, these powers chose to function with more limited constituencies, moving away from multilateralism and the United Nations, because as it became more representative, it also became less amenable to easily following directives. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you. The first General Assembly resolution was meant to preserve atomic technology for peaceful purposes. However, great powers thereafter dragged their feet on nuclear disarmament, establishing a system of haves and have-nots. Next year, we will witness the 50th anniversary of the Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. It will also be 25 years after its indefinite extension in 1995. Nevertheless, today, none of the nuclear weapon states, 50 years after the initiation of, of the uh, convention, have disarmed themselves of nuclear weapons, and more states have acquired nuclear weapon technology. If this is a success story, I'm not sure exactly what our parameters are in determining that. The economic story also merits review. In a recent article in The Guardian, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz argues that the way we assess economic and social progress is fundamentally wrong, and that, inter alia, we suffer from an inequality crisis. He also highlights that in spite of increase in GDP in many countries, there is political discontent. We must ask ourselves why. Angel Gurria, Secretary General of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, has written, it is only by having better metrics that truly reflect people's lives and aspirations that we will be able to design and implement better policies for better lives. The same applies to nation states. The rules governing the world order have to be commensurate with the common need, not only those of the more prosperous between us. Ladies and gentlemen, for the international community to move forward in sustained development that ensures peace and security, a number of basic principles and actions need to be our guidelines and be accorded priority. A fair, free, rule-based system applied without prejudice or preference is imperative. Two, the international system must move from concepts of balance of power to those of balance of interest. And by that I mean not only a balance between nation states, but also between exigent immediate needs and long-term consequences of our actions. Destroying the environment for the immediate material gains is not acceptable. Democratic practices, essentially ensuring stakeholders equal rights of participatory governance are important, are possible and important irrespective of the former government, culture, or tradition. However, these should be applied not only domestically, but also in the international realm. International governments for the community of nations has to have a collective allegiance. International relations, to be blunt, needs to be democrati democratized. Diplomacy in different disciplines and domains should once again become the primary tool for conflict resolution, with the use of force limited to self-defense or responding to aggression. And since I've been asked to highlight a Middle Eastern perspective, let me close by saying that the Middle East, the Middle Eastern states, all of whom are medium-sized, at the utmost, 
are best served by a free, fair, rule-based world order. Balances of power alone is a, th is a fickle relative concept, reg both regionally and globally. It will not provide sustainable security on global or regional issues in the long term. And as they call, as the call for rights pursuant to international law, all states must also act in a commensurate fa fashion, be that in the application of their international practices or those which they choose to apply domestically. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, His Excellency Fahami. Now, we would like to open the floor for questions. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Before you ask any questions, please identify yourself, your name, and your affiliation. Any questions from the floor? Thank you very much. I'm a Watanabe. Neo Watanabe. I'm a researcher at the Sasaka Peace Foundation. I appreciate the uh, speech you very for the, the the ambitious and the very right and fair. So I'm also sharing a worry about the world, but I'm uh, more interested in what's going on in the Middle East. So how I'm, I'm the my the the interest is a very short. I'm I'm worried about a. Uh, tension between the United States and Iran. And uh, uh, of course, we don't want any conflict, as uh, President Trump uh, always say. But uh, uh, how is uh, your prospect in the short and the uh, mid? And uh, I think uh, Iran's position is very difficult to survive because of the sanction continues and uh, sanctions are very tightening. Uh, how much you are worried about a potential military conflict? unexpected one. Or what is uh, your view, how we could work on uh, Iran and uh, uh, United States uh, conflict in, uh, in this world? I would like to hear your suggestion. Do you want me to take them one by one or, or separate? This one. Uh, sure. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. The military balance between Iran and the U.S., of course, is very strongly in favor of the U.N., so I don't see an intentional direct confrontation militarily between Iran and the U.S. If that happens, it will be by mistake or as a result of a, a, a an operation that's gone too far. That being said, I think the uh, tension in the Middle East, particularly between Iran and the U.S., is very consequential and dangerous for the neighboring states in the region. Uh, the, the, what you're going to have is a triangle effect. Tension will create target zones that are not necessarily on either side, but would ultimately become conflicts within the region itself. How do you move mm -hmm. forward? Um, as I just said, for me, diplomacy comes first, it comes second, it comes third. It's only when you try that so many times that use of force is a serious option. Uh, I think that the only way to move forward is with a set of preliminary confidence building measures that uh, relate to Iran and its neighbors much more than Iran and the US. Uh, the real problem in the Middle East is that it seems to be a rather bizarre conflict here. Iran is not a threat to the U.S. in any serious sense, and the U.S. has no real reason to attack Iran strategically. It's a function of relations with other parts of the region, and uh, the confidence level between Iran and its neighbors is so low that if I was to call, as we traditionally do, let's have a meeting and have a dialogue, it would, not, it would be useless. Uh, so I would target a dialogue between region states but before doing that, suggest confidence building measures of a security nature, not, and I say this respectfully, not among the traditional diplomats, 
but mo more, more seriously among people dealing with security issues on both sides to see if we can start creating a gradual process which would ultimately lead to a, a balanced, uh, a, a more credible dialogue. The dialogue, when we get there, should have a, should target a clear process and, and objective of guidelines for regional relations. What can and what cannot be done regionally um, over and above what's done bilaterally. Because what we've seen here now is before but even after the JCPO agreement, uh, Arab states in the Gulf are more anxious about what Iran is doing. Iran is anxious about the U.S. after the U.S. withdrew from the JCPO. Uh, I think JCPO A was uh, a small step in a direction, not one that satisfied me, frankly, but it was a step in the right direction if it was followed up by more regional steps to deal with non-proliferation issues in the Middle East as a whole, it would have been much more uh, positive. I also believe that if it was followed up with quickly so by some political direction where the nuclear issue is the first step but then r the, the withdrawal of aggressive uh, Middle Eastern policies was another step. What's happening in the Levant? Iran has been frankly, quite uh, aggressive, both in Iraq and Syria and in Lebanon. Uh, these are just some examples. Now, having said that, and having openly said that I'm not parti I was not particularly enthusiastic about the JCPOA, I think withdrawing from the agreement was not the right step either. Rather than withdrawing from it, I would have actually asked to for more steps to be added to it, and that's really where my posture is. So it's going to be a tenuous situation, uh, crisis by mistake, if it happens between the U.S. and Iran, but more possibly crisis uh, between states in the region, and that's really where my concern is. I'm sorry, the time is running out. Uh, that was the final question. We would like to give uh, uh, His Excellency the big round of applause. Now, going on to the next keynote speaker, Ms. Avril Haynes, a former White House Deputy National Security Advisor and former Deputy Director of the uh, CIA in the United States. very much. First of all, thank you to Ambassador Sasai and to the Institute for inviting me to this. It's really quite special to be a part of the first Tokyo Global Dialogue and particularly to talk on a subject that's so dear to my heart, to be honest. But I also just want to offer my condolences for Prime Minister Nakasone. Thank you very much for those words that were said. So I found that as I was putting together my remarks on the subject, to provide you with a perspective from the United States on this issue and on the past, present, future of the international order, that I have more questions than answers at this particular moment. Is the international order really contested today in ways that it was not previously? Or do we have higher expectations for it than we did 50 years ago? And thus see it as failing our unrealistic expectations. And what should we expect from the international order? And how does the international order connect to the competition between democracies and authoritarian powers that we see today? And can the international order help us to manage disruptive technologies, globalization, populism, or has it become part of the problem? And what constitutes the international order? Is it just a set of discrete international laws and norms or a liberal approach to defense alliances and partnerships among countries with shared values, something else? Has it relied since World War II on the United States acting as the hegemon to enforce the order? And if so, as the gap 
in power and influence between the United States and the rest of the world shifts, who will take on a leadership role and help to enforce that order? And perhaps most of all for today, how can we reimagine the international order so that it can help us thrive in the future? I don't have answers to all of these questions, but I do have views and observations that I hope can contribute in some small way to the dialogue we'll have over the next few days. And I know I'll learn from each of you, and it's my hope that I'll come away with a few more answers after this discussion. But first, I want to spend a few moments on what I mean, at least, by the international order when I refer to it, as I do think that's a fundamental question that should be addressed in these gatherings, particularly as I suspect each of our answers is grounded to some extent in a slightly different historical context. In fact, in the United States and in many parts of Europe, I would say, we are experiencing a kind of existential crisis about what our position should be versus vis-a-vis -vis the liberal international order and its value. And this question of what we mean when we refer to and liberal international order with such reverence, assuming that people understand and accept its fundamental goodness, may be part of the problem. A colleague relayed a story to me that I think exemplifies the reaction of many in the United States. He was at a campaign event in Ohio, which is in our Midwest, in 2016 for presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. And someone came up to him afterwards to talk to him about one of the answers that she had given to a question that referred to the liberal international order. And the man from Ohio summed up his reaction by saying to my friend, I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to, but I don't like any of those three words. <laughs> and when I refer to the liberal international order, I mean the post-World War II international framework that's made up of norms, of treaties, institutions, partnerships that have helped us to prevent and manage disputes, mobilize action against common threats, and no one country that no one country can address alone, and govern international conduct to advance peace, common values, and prosperity. And I see the alliances and partnerships that are defined by this framework as a fundamental feature of the order. And generally, I'm of the view that this framework, while not perfect, has served us very well in many critical respects. To start on an optimistic note, I'd say that it is in large part thanks to the international system that it has been decades since we've seen a war between major powers. Over the last 25 years, more than 1 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. We've saved over 60 million lives from measles, malaria, tuberculosis. And as my former boss, President Obama, would say, if you had to choose one moment in history in which you could be born, and you didn't know ahead of time if you were going to be particular nationality, what gender you would be, what race, whether you'd be rich or poor, gay or straight, you'd choose today. But we often talk about the liberal international order in such vague terms that I think it's worth listing a few specific and recent examples of how the order we built has allowed us to solve problems and take advantage of specific opportunities while also trying to be honest about its shortcomings. When Ebola swept through West Africa, our response benefited greatly from the resources of the World Health Organization, which was established by an international agreement. When the globe was gripped by a worldwide financial crisis, the World Bank and the IMF allowed us to take measures to respond and mitigate the recession. And when we needed a force to maintain fragile peace in South Sudan, in Haiti, in Kashmir, the UN Security Council authorized sending in the blue helmets in other words, the international order has repeatedly allowed us to mobilize unprecedented collective action to address challenges central to global prosperity and stability. Another example, in my view, is the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the associated institutions and norms that have effectively reduced the chance of nuclear war. And the Iran deal which demonstrated how a rules-based international order was capable of providing sufficient leverage to change another country's behavior in our national security interest without resorting to the use of military force. We imposed unprecedented sanctions on Iran through the UN Security Council in response to its nuclear program, 
and then led a hard-fought campaign of multilateral diplomacy that achieved the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And as a result, Iran dismantled two-thirds of its installed centrifuges, shipped 98 percent of their enriched uranium stockpile out of the country, and we put a lid on the nuclear program without ever using force. And these are specific examples of how the system we built has truly helped us to manage economic crises, prevent and manage conflict, and even address health pandemics to the great benefits of our populations just in the last two decades. But the international order is not infallible, and it does not solve all problems, even in the security realm. For example, in the context of the South China Sea, we've seen that the international order has not been able to address successfully China's aggressive behavior in that region, nor did it prevent Russia from taking Crimea. And moreover, when it comes to Syria, the international order did not provide a solution. While some might argue that this is because the international order is not being upheld as it once was, I'm not confident that this is the case. In the case of the South China Sea and Ukraine, the tensions that exist are old ones and are manifesting in new forms and within a changing geopolitical landscape in which the international order serves as a tool and can be helpful in managing the potential for conflict, but it is not a solution. In the case of Syria, the international rules themselves were not what many wanted them to be. Given that traditional interpretation of international law did not provide a basis for using military force against Assad when he brutalized his own people. And our institutions and alliances also did not facilitate the mobilization of collective action to address the problem early on in the crisis. But I want to be clear, I do think the international order is being challenged today in new ways. In my view, the challenges arise from a number of different directions. First, the United States, which has typically been seen as a bulwark, at least in the context of the security alliances and partnerships that make up the international order, is becoming seen as less reliable. President Trump's comments about NATO, the recent withdrawal from northern Syria, the sense that we have shifted to a zero-sum approach to foreign policy have all contributed to a concern that we will not be there when our friends and allies need us. And in support of the international order, and the reality is, of course, that much depends on the goodwill of states. And here I think there's cause for some limited optimism. If you listen to the political debates in the United States right now, everyone expresses support for alliances and partnerships. And while the American people express skepticism about other aspects of the international order, recent polls show substantial support for our alliances and security structures. I'm of the view that for future administrations will come back to this theme, but I also think that shifting trends in global power dynamics require us to make some adjustments. The United States would not be relied upon, should not be relied upon, as the sole leader for enforcing global security norms. We must be more effective at pulling together coalitions of states to address these issues on a regional basis. And we've seen Japan tentatively step forward on these issues, and I hope that many others will as well. But this is a critical test of the order for our next generation of leaders. For an order is only as good as those who are willing to invest in it and sacrifice for it. Second, there is not the popular support in the United States and parts of Europe that used to exist for the liberal international order more broadly beyond security alliances. In fact, it is an issue on which many Americans are divided, and this makes it harder for leaders who want to support it to do so, but also for it to evolve and develop to meet the new challenges of the day and thus continue to be effective. When an issue becomes politicized, <coughs> The debate around it becomes more binary and less nuanced. And with people for and against, there's less room for views that indicate some aspects are useful but can be improved. A binary dialogue does not facilitate the appropriate development of the order in ways that are likely to address new challenges as they arise. For example, in the United States, we've seen how a strain of popular skepticism regarding international agreements, which represent the bones of the international order, have affected our ability to move forward. This skepticism has effectively stalled what used to be a relatively healthy dynamic between our Congress and the executive branch regarding international law and institutions, making it extremely challenging to get, for example, Senate approval of relatively uncontroversial treaties. Since 1960, the US Senate has provided advice and consent to ratification of over 800 treaties. 
a rate of more than one treaty every month. Between 1995 and 2000, when President Clinton was in office and Jesse Helms, a Southern Senator who was not known for embracing international law, chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Senate approved over 140 treaties, including the Chemical Weapons Convention, the START Treaty, and treaties dealing with labor rights, law enforcement cooperation, environmental protection, investment protection. But during the course of the Obama administration, the Senate provided advice and consent to just over 20 treaties, or roughly 2.5 a year, a fraction of the historical average, and no treaties have been submitted by the Trump administration. In my view, perhaps the key reason, though not the only reason, for reduced popular support in the United States for the international order is that the economic order that the liberal international order has promoted is seen by many to have eroded the social contract that previously ensured support of that order and to instead have reinforced existing inequities in our society. Free trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties, the WTO, have all contributed to our economic growth by helping American businesses operate in and export their products to foreign markets, protect intellectual property of American innovators. Bilateral tax treaties make it possible for U.S. companies with overseas presences not to be subject to dual taxation. But most Americans have not seen the prosperity that these agreements promised, and this is not true just in the United States. In the midst of a period of sustained global economic growth with millions of people having been lifted out of extreme poverty and gaining access to greater resources and opportunity, that growth is not being distributed across our populations. Instead, the concentration of wealth at the top of the income distribution is skyrocketing. Since 1990, income inequality has risen in the vast majority of advanced economies and in most emerging economies. Indeed, since 1980, the global top 1% earners have captured as much of the global economic growth in the world as the bottom 50% of poorest individuals. And this is a particularly serious problem in the United States, which has the highest level of income inequality among the world's 30 most advanced economies and it has been growing. In the 1980s, the top 1% of adults earned 27 times more than the bottom 50%. Now they earn 81 times more. And the increase in the income gap is almost entirely due to the growth of income for those in the highest income brackets. Whereas the economic growth for those in the bottom half of the income distribution in the United States has essentially stalled since the 1980s. In short, the liberal international order has promoted prosperity, but not for all. And if we are to make a convincing case to the people, the United States and other countries, and perhaps to have other middle and working class voters support it, we're going to have to make changes to the order and to our own domestic structures to ensure that we live up to the values that are intended to be embedded in these frameworks. Third, new disruptive technologies New domains such as cyber and globalization are issues that people question whether a liberal and consequently inclusive order is capable of managing, particularly one that is grounded in state-to-state -state relationships. With the rise of empowered non-state actors increasingly challenged state governance, this is not an unreasonable concern. We should be exploring new ways of negotiating legal frameworks for new technologies so as to more effectively involve the private sector and consider systems that involve sub-state actors, such as states, provinces, megacities, which are frequently capable of engaging more effectively than centralized or federal governments. In sum, if we are in fact to promote a reimagined, liberal, or inclusive international order for the future, I think we have to make some changes. First, I would argue that we, the foreign policy national security community, need to focus on how the international order can meaningfully improve the lives of individuals. Think through ways of promoting a system that does not reinforce or exacerbate existing inequities in our populations. And get used to explaining and justifying our work through that lens with specific examples. Furthermore, it's important to recognize that although aspects of the existing international order have served us well, it is far from perfect, and we need to be able to discuss its flaws as we talk about its successes if we are to remain credible. Second, it will be important to recognize that the world is changing, and the international order will need to change with it. Shifting trends in power dynamics around the globe require new frameworks and new approaches. 
More leaders will need to step up to assist in enforcing the order and to do so on a regional basis to prevent, among other things, the bullying behavior of those states with significant power to ignore the rules when convenient. And moreover, the rise of empowered non-state actors and an increasing crisis of governance within many of our nations requires new norms, institutions, legal structures to promote an international order that is capable of promoting the peace, security, values that we wish to promote. Third, many of the trends we are experiencing today, such as increased mobility, disruptive technologies that include hostile activities on the internet to promote disinformation and the erosion of trust in facts and economic globalization are particularly challenging for democracies as opposed to authoritarian powers. And these are not issues that can be addressed entirely through an international order, but an international order must be part of the solution as these are inherently cross-border issues. And unless we work together to address these challenges, we won't only risk the liberal international order, but the critical values that underpin our order and weaken our capacity for self-governance in our democracy. But on that ominous note, perhaps, but I would just thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts and ask a few questions. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Haynes. Now we'd like to open the floor for questions. Yes, please raise your hand if you have any question. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for your very inspiring remarks. Uh, next year will be 25 years that I've been an academic teaching young people. And that story about the man in Ohio who reacted rather negatively to liberal international order, I'm reacting very positively to two words up there, global dialogue. And I think you emphasized that at the end, that we're living in a world, it seems, the more we travel and we talk to people across the political spectrum, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of feeling of being left out of this liberal international order, of this international community. So how would you address that? You've been in a position of leadership and power and representing Washington. What would you share with me that I can tell my students? I'm uh, teaching at Ky Kyoto Gaidai and I'm a professor emeritus, Nancy Snow. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I've done some writing, but I can refer to others who have really tried to expose the way in which, frankly, the international order has brought value to people in a very day-to-day -day way that people don't think of, in a sense. And I think it's a sort of a beginning of a conversation to say, particularly for us in America and, uh, you know, um, in talking to audiences who question, as you say, the value of what is described so obliquely as an international order, to explain to them how it is that that order has actually affected them in ways they don't even realize. Every time they take an airplane, every time they send a letter, every time they send an email, every aspect of their life in a sense has benefited from global cooperation on a whole series of different levels. And I think that's a, a piece of the puzzle. But it is also to say that in addition to the, you know, the story that we all tell about security and global security and how important it is uh, in that respect, that we do need to be more mindful, I think, in our own domestic decision-making about what contributes to that international order, ways in which we actually address uh, those parts of our population that don't feel as if they benefited particularly from the economic prosperity that the order is supposed to bring us, in a sense. And to make sure that we're doing that across these lines is critical, in, in my view. But I also think that one of our greatest challenges, at least in the United States, is frankly, domestic governance right now. And, and I think that is contributing to our challenges on a foreign um, and international basis. So anyway, I'll leave it at that, but thank you very much. Any further questions? If you'd like to take uh, questions from two people and then have uh, Mr. Nadal answer them both. Thank you very much for your comprehensive talk. Um, I would like to, my name is Theo Akasaka, I'm president of the Foreign Affairs Center of Japan. Uh, 
Um, my question regard, uh, is concerning this topic you didn't mention. That is the relationship between the United States and China. The liberal international order is shaking uh, largely because of the rise of China and the uncertainty about the future of China. Uh, is the United States uh, going to uh, uh, continue some sort of a confrontational approach with China, uh, believing that China is not coming to the liberal international order or come to the side of the West? Or is there any way that the United States government will try to induce China to come closer to the current liberal international order? Would you like to receive the next question? Shinichi Yokohama from NTT. I'm Chief Information Security Officer of NTT. My question is about the role of private sectors or industries. And at the beginning of your remark, you mentioned two fundamental questions. One is what should we expect to the global security? And if there is a gap, who should take a lead in filling the gap? And I'd like to listen to your views about the role of the private sector in those questions. Two great questions in which we could have separate speeches, I think. <laughs> so on, on China, um, you know, where you ended your question in a way is, is where I begin it. Will we do anything to induce China to come into the international order more effectively? I, we've been trying for a very long time, as you may have noticed, and uh, with Japan next to us and others, obviously, um, in this context. And honestly, I, I do think that China's relationship to the international order is, uh, is complicated, which is to say that I don't see China as rejecting the international order, generally, but I do see China as challenging certain aspects of it. And in those spaces, I think we do have to confront China. I think that's part of what it means to stand up for the international order, in a sense. So I, I do think that in the future, we will continue to see confrontations between the United States and China. I very much hope that they will not end up escalating into what would be a conflict. I don't think that's in either country's interest. But I do think that pushing back where you see actions that are assertive, inconsistent with the international order is a part of what's important in trying to preserve it. And, um, and so that, I think that's it, it, probably without getting into more complicated answers, sort of the, the more simplistic, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I imagine you have some quite interesting ones given your position. I, um, on the private sector, so I find this an awfully complicated question also. This is something I'm spending some time on myself and I'll just give you a little bit of how I'm thinking about it. After coming out of government for so long, um, one of the things that I have come to think at this point is that governments cannot alone solve the problems that we're facing in the world today, that we really do need other actors to essentially pull in. And that doesn't mean that I don't think it's important to invest in government, and in government has to be part of the solution. They just can't do it alone, right? And what I've been fascinated by coming out of government is seeing how many multinational corporations are moving into this space in ways that I had not seen 10 or 15 or even 20 years ago, right? And uh, many multinational companies have their own foundations. They do a variety of work that um, they're interested in uh, things that I would have thought of as governmental type assistance like access to education or variety of things like that. And, um, and they are extraordinarily powerful. Many multinational companies are more powerful than some states. It's you know an increasing non-state actor sort of power dynamic that's occurring per states. I also see companies as having a specific agenda and even though I think many of them are acting in goodwill in trying to do things that they believe are important for their societies and, and the markets within which they are working, the reality is I don't think it's the same as a state doing it and certainly not a state that 
uh, sets an agenda based on a democratic process and identifies what it believes to be the priorities and the ways in which we should address these issues. So the question for me then becomes how do you facilitate private public action so that you can really help to take advantage of the power and the effort that is in the private sector, but at the same time to ensure that there is a sort of a democratic check on that agenda and that there's greater transparency in that space and that there's a way to actually um, facilitate an integrated effort. And I think that's what we're particularly challenged on right now. I, and I saw in government how difficult it was to interact with the private sector in an effective way and to share things in both directions. There's uh, not always a source of trust between these different um, relationships, but also there are a lot of rules and regulations that are were passed for very good reasons so that the government is not prioritizing or um, uh, providing favors to one company over another in certain circumstances and so on. But the reality is we have to figure out a way to have a conversation that doesn't create those challenges but does allow us to push on these issues in ways that integrates the private sector. So I do see them filling the gap, whether we like it or not, and I think it's something that we're going to have to figure out how we channel it in a way that's effective. Sorry, I, it's so hard to give subtle answers to these issues and, um, and I know all of you are quite expert and have uh, better thinking than I do on these questions. But I, do we have time for more or should I be done? Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll welcome the third uh, uh, keynote speak, uh, speaker. Mr. Thierry de Montbriand, Executive Chairman of French Institute of International Relations. Thank you very much. Well, first I would like to congratulate uh, the Japan Institute for International Affairs, which I understand is 60 years old, which is uh, quite young. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, my first uh, trip to Japan was, to be very precise, in October of 1973. I had just been, uh, I was uh, young at the time, uh, director of the policy planning staff in the French Foreign Ministry. And uh, I think it is the first time I had an opportunity to meet with the Japan Institute for International, International Affairs, which was 17 years old. <laughs> so uh, congratulations, and I am very pleased to be here in Japan for the something like the hundredth time. Uh, I, I would like to be a little provocative because it is the uh, best way, I think, to uh, wake uh, everybody up. And first remark I would like to make is that the idea that there was before, uh, before, before I don't know when exactly, such thing like a liberal international order is a myth. It is a total myth. There was no international order. There was, uh, after the Second World War, something which was called the Cold War. And the Cold War started until the collapse of the Soviet Union. That is, to be very precise, uh, December 1991. Actually, the collapse of the Soviet Union took two uh, years, starting with the collapse or the end of the communist order in Eastern Europe uh, the, uh, during uh, 1989, and the Soviet Union itself collapsed in uh, December of 1991. So who could say that there was an international order between 1945 and 1989 or 1991? There was a liberal Western order which is something totally different. And uh, even that is more subtle because essentially during the Cold War, the world was divided in, well, three parts, well, in, in, a, in a fuzzy way. It was a, that was the so-called West, the Western Alliance, essentially organized around the Western 
NATO, no, and to which uh, uh, Japan was uh, 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 added because we, we used to say typically in an institution like the Trilateral Commission that some of you know well, uh, Japan was part of the West. And by the way, when we wanted to come here to Tokyo, we had to go through Anchorage because it was uh, uh, quite difficult actually to overflow uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, at the time. I don't know how many tens of times I have uh, taken that route. And um, so Japan was considered to be a Western country too, which uh, a bit, a bit uh, <laughs> overfetched, you know. Uh, the, the uh, but, uh, you know, the, the a huge part of the world was absolutely uh, ally, ally, uh, alliant to this, to, to, to this order, the, the Soviet world which and, uh, and, and the so-called third world, the third part, and the third world that was at the time of decolonization. And in fact, it was a field of competition for the, uh, the Soviet world and uh, the, the Western world. And more often than not, the, 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 the communist part of the world was stronger than the, than, than the East. And uh, should I also remind you that uh, after the victory of Mao Zedong in 1949, uh, it was the, 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 the Soviet world was considered by everybody to be uh, extended to, to part of, of Asia. And it was only after the uh, Sino-Soviet uh, schism in uh, 1960 that people started to think that uh, something like uh, communism extending all over the planet was not bound to succeed. So uh, I have to remind these things because uh, as very often we are reconstructing a past which never uh, existed. So uh, now, is it possible to build an international order well, first, is it possible to build an international order full stop? It has never existed, so it would be the first <laughs> time, you know. So, is it possible to build an international order based on free, fair, you know that fair, fairness is one of the most difficult concepts to, to define, and uh, everything we say today, today about inequalities and all these things, and Avril was very good at, the, at that exercise, but uh, the same people never spoke in those terms just a few years ago. It is, it is a relatively recent uh, uh, interest that we all have, probably largely to a large extent due the, to the explosion of technological uh, uh, progress. <laughs> but, okay, fair, fair, and transparent. Well. Transparent, transparency is one of the biggest uh, myths uh, in life, you know. Would any of you, ladies and gentlemen, like to be so transparent that I could immediately see what you are thinking about right now? No? So, uh, I am not, of course, pleading against transparency, transparency, but I, I think that if we talk about transparency, we have to be much more precise about uh, what, what we mean. And by the way, transparency would also imply to give a, a, a proper definition of tr transparency, transparency, it, it would uh, require a proper definition of uh, full information because transparency, the concept of transparency and information are closely uh, related. And it is, of course, impossible to have full information about anything. No, it, it, uh, it's also a very doubtful, uh, doubt, doubtful concept. So what I would like to do is, uh, if, if, if nevertheless you force me to give an answer, is it possible to, my answer is no. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, 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 then, then, then we can start to, to you know, I think it is Nabil who, who said that his answer is yes, but I know him and I admire him enough to tell him friendly that he said that, but he doesn't believe it. So, <laughs> but, but, we can, but, but, but we can talk about it, and, 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 and Nabil. So, uh, now what I would like to do with you is a little bit of more classical geopolitics, because 
uh, classical geopolitics is still uh, relevant to a large extent. Uh, of course, uh, the technological developments in, in, in particular have made things much more difficult, but nevertheless, geopolitics is still uh, relevant. Uh, the defining turning point since the Second World War is uh, clearly the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the collapse of the Soviet Union, I would just like to remind one thing about it. It is, in fact, two events for the price of one, if I can say so. One is, uh, of course, the collapse of the, the, the communist political system and the failure of the communist political system to a large extent is the consequence of the technological revolution because they were unable you know, uh, to uh, compete uh, with uh, the United States in particular and the West in general uh, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, economic development. They, they, they could not do it uh, through uh, their uh, incapacity, the incapacity of their military system to, to catch up. And uh, the second aspect is the collapse of the Russian Empire. I, it's important to distinguish between the two because of the, the, 19th, the 20th century is the story of collapse of empires. You know, all and and the, the Russian Empire was the last one to collapse. And it took place it, it, in the first stage in a relatively smooth way. Uh, but collapse, the collapse of empires is always, historically speaking, a long, long-term phenomenon. And I think that what we have been seeing in the last 30 years is just the beginning of the consequences of the collapse of the, so of the Russian, I say the Russian Empire. And uh, the collapse of the Russian Empire has reopened uh, issues that had been frozen after the collapse of the first, after the First World War, uh, the collapse of uh, the... Uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire in, in, in the German Empire in Europe, uh, and of course the Ottoman Empire, which it seems to me, I say it humbly before Nabil, uh, the, the beginning of everything, because it has the collapse of the Ottoman Empire has you know, reopened uh, everything, the whole game in the Middle East. Of course, the Ottoman Empire had been weak at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. But all these issues are still uh, uh, with us. Now, all this being given, we, what is the situation today? And I think we can state it relatively simply, looking over the next 30 years. Why the next 30 years? Because in 30 years from now, ladies and gentlemen, we will be in 2049. Hmm? And what is 2049? 2049 will be the 100th anniversary of the victory of Mao Zedong. And the Chinese are now openly saying, uh, openly, which was not the case until Ho Jintao. Uh, this uh, started with uh, Xi Jinping. Now they are openly stating their ambition to be the number one country in the world. And they say it openly. And uh, we, they are not children, the, the, the Chinese. They talk, uh, that's absolutely true, uh, uh, Avril, they talk about uh, the international order. They would like to change the international order to their favor, but they... they so they are not entirely status quo power. They want to change the international order. They want to avoid war because the Chinese strategic thinking has always been uh, avoiding war, to win without waging, wi 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 without fighting. That has always been their fundamental strategy. But this being said, they want to have all the attributes of power in the most classical sense. That is uh, military power and, of course, a technological power which underlies all kinds of military power. It is open. We do not need to. And it, it, it's very interesting because listening to, 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 to China, to the Chinese, they have a double speech. They have several levels of, 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 of speeches. And according to one level of their speech, they are a nice country which want to develop 
uh, good uh, relations with everybody on the planet, uh, mutually beneficial, economically, etc., etc., uh, socially and economically benefiting. And uh, at the level, at the second level, it's a pure power ga game. We are talk talking about Southeast uh, Ch China uh, Sea. Uh, there is no doubt it's a pure power game. And by the way, they are not the only ones not to pay any attention to international law. I'm sorry to say the U.S. doesn't pay much attention to international law, uh, typically in the case of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, as we saw just uh, uh, a few uh, days or weeks uh, ago. And usually great powers do not pay much attention to international law. I mean, w when they become weaker, then they start to pay. For instance, even the French, I can, I can do under the goal, they didn't pay much attention to international law. So France started to pay more attention to international law when we became, in relative terms, weaker. And when we are really very small, then we will be the champions of international uh, law. And uh, not everybody can do uh, like uh, Monsieur Juncker, who was, uh, you know, the outgoing, uh, the, uh, the outgoing uh, president of the European Commission. Before that, he was prime minister of the Netherlands, and he once made, a, that's a true story, made a trip to, to China, and after having drunk a few, glasses of, a few glasses of wine, because he likes uh, wine and other alcohols, and he raised his glass with, uh, I think it was Hu, Hu Jintao, in Beijing and said, China and Luxembourg together, it's one fourth of human population, <laughs> uh, which, was, which was factually true. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, the, the relation with international law depends very much on, 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 the, on, on the position of the scale of, 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 of power. So, uh, in fact, 2000, uh, 2049 is the date we have to have in mind. And I, I do believe uh, uh, there was a very interesting question uh, on uh, U.S.-China relations. What U.S.-China relation will be the dominant relation in the next 30 years. This will be the most important issue that we have to look at. And... Um, as for the United States, I think, unfortunately, of course, we, we, most of us do not like Mr. Trump too much. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, and here I respectfully disagree slightly with you, Evril, I think that uh, the United States will no longer be like before because whoever is in power, and it started with Obama, because uh, Europe in particular, and, and classical treatises uh, that were, that were uh, uh, signed after World War II, uh, today the, the world is different. The context is entirely different. The priorities are different. And uh, therefore, uh, I think we have all the rest, you know, we have to uh, prepare ourselves for a different world. And as uh, also Nabil said very uh, elegantly, you know, the, uh, if uh, in the Middle East or elsewhere we have had so many problems, it's perhaps, uh, in at least in some extent, because we have not paid enough attention and not made enough efforts uh, to uh, uh, ensure by ourselves, or more by ourselves, our own security. You know. Uh, so all of us have to rethink uh, the security uh, in issue in those terms. Now, the question uh, is, I know that in uh, Japan particularly, uh, but not only in Japan, there are uh, people who believe that the China is actually in deep trouble. I hear this very often, uh, that the uh, that economic situation is much more difficult uh, than they say, uh, that they have uh, significant international problems, uh, that Hong Kong uh, might be a very serious uh, uh, issue for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, it is difficult, and if it is not, if it were not difficult for China, uh, Xi Jinping would not have come in power because Hu Jintao was considered to be a weak leader, uh, not a strong leader, and they, they wanted to have a strong leader precisely to be able to 
face uh, some difficult uh, situations. But uh, to bet that China is so weak that uh, they will lose uh, their, uh, their, their fight, uh, their competition, the competition with the United States uh, in the next few years or in a matter of one or two decades, I think uh, would uh, be well, running the risk of wishful thinking. Uh, and uh, starting with that hypothesis uh, is, in my judgment, in my humble judgment, a big mistake. And by the way, if such were the case, and uh, if uh, in the limit uh, there could, would be a, a, a real collapse of the communist regime or the so-called communist regime in China, that could be a real catastrophe for the whole world. I remember a conversation with Li Kuan Yu, who was a very wise man, and who said there is something even worse than a strong China, which is a too weak China. And economically, you know, just imagine a, 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 a revolution, because in, in the history of China, at every change of dynasty, this is the communist dynasty, there has been a civil war. So uh, if, this, if it is w w what we have in the next few years, I think it would be, uh, it would of course be a totally new uh, situation again, but not necessarily uh, much better than the, 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 than the situation we are having now. Now, if they, are, if they remain strong, which I think is the by far the most likely uh, hypothesis, uh, then uh, it means, uh, as I said, that the issue of uh, uh, US-China rivalry will be the dominant situation and all of us, we will have to uh, adjust to that in the, most, in the smartest way. And uh, the, uh, the question was raised also briefly, briefly about a possible war between the US and the uh, 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 and, and China, uh, personally, I do not believe that the so-called Thucydides trap of Graham Allison will work in this way. What could happen would be uh, more the Kindleberger trap, as uh, John I uh, says, that is a war arising through the deterioration of a global economic situation, that is the failure of the failure of global economic governance, which is not exactly the same. The only case when we could have a real classical war would be on Taiwan, in my judgment again. Uh, could Hong Kong facilitate, increase the risk of that? I uh, do not believe so, uh, in one word, uh, because time is going too fast, but uh, I think that Hong Kong, no, Hong Kong will go back legally to China in 2047 anyway. So uh, what could happen is that there will be more and more the young, the, the youth would probably go to exile, will leave the country probably uh, gradually, and the major economic <coughs> activities will move from uh, Hong Kong to other places in, uh, in China, uh, you know, to Shenzhen, uh, uh, Shanghai, and, uh, and elsewhere. But in a way, in a way, there is no risk for uh, uh, China to to lose the Hong Kong, uh, uh, the Hong Kong uh, uh, struggle, if it is one. Uh, and for them, it is more a problem of image and how they they, they handle the, the 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 situation. But on Taiwan, that could be a real challenge because they are now speaking a tougher and tougher language on on, on, on Taiwan. And if there were to be, there is, there is a war going on right now. That's a cyber war. The cyber war is raging now with, uh, between uh, mainland China, China and, and, and Taiwan. But apart from that, I cannot uh, imagine easily uh, a, a real war. I will uh, end these uh, remarks by a few uh, points on, 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 on Europe. Uh, you see, first, uh, for us, the European Union, the challenge was that the collapse of the Soviet Union was unforeseen, of course, and it was 
unforeseeable. I could, that's a philosophical remark, but we could no time to discuss that. So we had to adjust very quickly to this uh, extraordinary situation. And the fact that we have enlarged so quickly, you know, we were 12 in 1989, now we are 27. Uh, and the fact that we have enlarged so quickly in two countries which were totally unprepared to join us and that we have achieved that without collapsing is in itself a great success. But uh, it takes time, you know, to adjust to that, to such an extraordinary uh, uh, development. Uh, personally, I think that the Eurozone is the backbone now of the European construction. And I think that in spite of all these difficulties that we speak uh, uh, day after day, uh, the French-German uh, uh, differences, we have always had uh, you know, disputes and, and, and uh, uh, always, uh, ever since, uh, uh, since uh, especially the, the, the time the, the, the European Union exists. But uh, I uh, do not anticipate the uh, uh, death of the European Union, not only that, but you know, after Brexit, the decision on Brexit, the, the first consequence it, it had was to stop countries like the Netherlands and others to speak anymore about, uh, uh, about the possibility of withdrawing. So uh, the European Union is not dead. If we have time for question, I can say more, but my uh, last sentence will be to say that I think the not only us in Europe, but the rest of the world needs a strong Europe. Why? Because we are no longer and we will never be again an imperialistic power, but uh, we are really an associa a free association of countries that totally new in history, economically relatively su successful in spite of all the difficulties. And uh, in a certain sense, we are a uh, model of a social democracy uh, which works. It is difficult, but it works. We need you and you need us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. de Montbrier. Now I'd like to open the floor. We would like to entertain two questions at once. Terry and I uh, see each other every other week in different events. Almost. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've always, and I say this very honestly, I've always enjoyed his enlightening speeches. Uh, they're not only entertaining, but very enlightening. He's a very wise man and very st straightforward. I asked for the floor, nevertheless, to actually challenge you. Uh, we know each other well and clearly in my support for a free, f uh, a fair, and uh, transparent system, I wasn't assuming we're going to get the perfect thing. But if I have to choose between a system based on geopolitics and a balance of power and an imperfect system based on free, fair, and a transparent rule, I would choose the second. And as you correctly said, as France gets closer to us size-wise and influence-wise, you'll also share that opinion. One, thank you, Nabil. One, one short uh, addition, because it's a point I, I should have made before. Personally, I do not see any fundamental con uh, contradiction between power politics, balance of power, and collective security. Because more often than not, people you know, want to choose collective security or balance of power. I think the reality is both. You have to have both. Even, even within the European Union. If the European Union has relatively well succeeded so far, it is because there is no one country which dominates the rest. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, when, when France was, uh, was, was much stronger than Germany, there was a fear uh, ab about France. Now, some people feared about Germany. They realize that Germany is not so strong, in particular in the military field, etc. There is a certain balance of, of power. So the, the art, the whole art of building a new order is to find a proper combination of, of both. And this is why countries, small countries, which do not care about their own security 
and do b and believe that they can rely entirely on a collective security system to which they do not contribute, they are wrong. So all of us must make efforts, must share efforts, not in the uh, uh, burden sharing uh, Trump way that is, uh, please uh, pay more. No, if, if we pay more, it should not be to buy uh, uh, necessarily American weapons. By the way, uh, we have very good weapons too in France. <laughs> We can take one more question. <coughs> Introduction, which was, uh, I'm here. Inga <laughs> Miyamai, uh, I'm the Norwegian ambassador in Japan. Uh, thank you for your provocative comments. And if I may be a little bit provocative in return, uh, are you not in dismissing the possibility of building an international order, making the typically French mistake of dismissing the ideal uh, <coughs> to the detriment of the good. Dismissing uh, what, sorry? <laughs> when you dismiss the possibility of building an international order, aren't you in the danger of committing the typically French mistake of dismissing the good uh, in favor of the ideal? Um, even in a world where not all states are created equal, uh, an international system of treaties and institutions might still be beneficial, uh, of course, for small countries like mine, but even for great countries like France. Uh, I think we heard earlier today some very good examples of that, even w outside the realm of uh, geopolitics and security. No, but uh, I, I agree that you have an international system that... Uh, uh, works that is respected uh, would be the best uh, situation. You, you are the idealist, not me. Uh, but look, for instance, at the uh, very good example, the GCPOA, that, that was also mentioned uh, briefly by uh, Nabil. Uh, I, 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 I think that in a proper international order, the number one principle is that you, you do not denounce unilaterally a treaty that you have signed. No. So, uh, and even if the GCPOA was not a perfect uh, treaty, uh, many of us uh, share that view, uh, just, uh, just denouncing it or denouncing one after the other, you know, all the basic treatises that have been uh, built up uh, over decades on, uh, in the fields of arms control. I think it's a fundamental uh, mistake uh, because it propagates mistrust. And I think that this world, you know, uh, the, the lack of trust is uh, that also, uh, again, I refer to Nabil's speech, uh, that is a, a fundamental, unfortunate aspect of uh, in the Middle East, but it is the same everywhere today. You know, trust has been destroyed at all uh, uh, levels. Uh, whatever we think of Russia uh, and, and the reasons for the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and in my judgment, the huge mistakes that the West has made with Russia uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which to a large extent expands, explains the, the 2014 uh, crisis, but the result today is a very, very low level of, of trust. So we have the number one step is to rebuild not only the Middle East, but everywhere as much as possible to rebuild uh, CB trust. And therefore, the, mo the, the key concept, if I had to mention one, would be CBM, confidence building measures. Uh, and that we, we, we have to do, and, and, and hopefully, we could move towards something else. So I don't, I don't uh, disagree with, with, with that uh, again. But we are starting now today from very, very low. That's the problem. Thank you very much. There is one question, but maybe we have no time. Um, no? So Finish? I'm sorry. Finish. Thank you. Thank you very much.